I'm Drew Most. I'm a translation consultant with um, Wycliffe Bible Translators, uh, partnering with SIL and based and working in Central Africa. I'm involved um, with helping three different language communities translate the Bible into their language for the first time. Two of those are currently working on the Old Testament. One of those is working on the New Testament. Uh, textual criticism has been a love of mine uh, for a really long time, just fascinated by the, whole, by the whole process and especially exciting developments that are taking place. Um, so really excited that everyone can be here, everybody joining in from all over the world. And I especially want to welcome our two guests, um, Dr. Peter Gurry and Dr. John Mead joining us from Phoenix. Um, Dr. Gurry uh, completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge. Um, he currently teaches New Testament and directs the Text and Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary. He's written a variety of books uh, on textual criticism. He's on the board for the Institute for Biblical Research and uh, book review editor for Text and Canon for the Religious Studies Review. Um, these guys are re really prolific on social media, really active on the evangelical textual criticism blog. So everybody will want to check that out. Um, Peter is also your co-editor, right, of this book that we're going to give away, Myths and Mistakes in New, Text New Testament Textual Criticism. So one uh, fortunate, blessed um, attendee will win their very own copy, which we will announce um, kind of halfway through. Um, our other guest is Dr. John Mead. Jo John, uh, Dr. Mead completed his PhD at uh, Southeastern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, and he teaches Old Testament language and literature courses along with Greek electives and biblical theology at Phoenix Seminary, where he co-directs the Text and Canon Institute um, with, with Dr. Gurry. He's a contributor of the Hex Apla Institute, for which his critical edition of the Hexapleric Fragments of Job is the first volume. Well done, exciting development. Um, he also has a recently released co-written biblical canon list from early Christianity, Texts and Analysis, Oxford University Press. Well done, you guys. Um, is there anything you guys want to say by way of introduction to get us started here? Anything more that we should know about yourselves before we jump in? Well, Drew, you made a, you made a not so subtle steal there, trying to get John Mead at Southeastern. <laughs> well, did I say Southeastern? Oh, it's Southern. Yeah, yeah. Did I say, oh, That's, man, oh no. That was subtle. Oh, that was subtle. That was subtle. <laughs> Southeastern is my alma mater. I apologize. That's right. No, so that's Southern. right. <laughs> oh, my apologies. Southern <laughs> Seminary, then. My apologies. <laughs> well, I just want to say because I knew John wouldn't. Good catch, text uh, critic, Dr. Gurry. Yeah, I got your back, John. Don't worry. <laughs> can you guys give us a little plug for the Text and Canon Institute? This it sounds like a new initiative. Sounds really exciting. What's going on? What's happening? How might people benefit from this institute? John, you yeah. Want to uh, I'll give a quick plug. Yeah, the Texas Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary is about a year and a half old. Uh, we started back in January of 2019. Uh, we, we founded this uh, institute as a way to foster uh, academic biblical scholarship into the Bible's text uh, and history, uh, languages, uh, the canon formation, uh, so, so we work at the highest level uh, in, in top tier academics. We also have a heart to mentor students uh, in our THM program uh, who want to go on and do PhD work in these same areas. And uh, lastly, we, we try to resource uh, the local church and parachurch organizations uh, doing webinars such as this or, or conferences through churches and, and, and other organizations. So. Uh, best way to follow us, I think, is maybe starting with the website, ps.edu slash TCI, okay? Uh, that would give you a whole lot of uh, information about us. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, as you mentioned, Drew, uh, at text and canon. So you can find us that way also. Anything else, Peter? Is that good? Yeah. 
All right. uh, maybe, oh, maybe just a quick mention of, um, for, for anybody who's, who's watching this as a student, um, one of the things we do is a fellowship that's a, a significant scholarship for our THM program, ah, which yeah. has a pretty heavy emphasis on languages and, um, and textual criticism. So for anybody out there who's, who's like an MDiv student and thinking about going on, uh, right. you might be interested in that. Yeah, good. So good. after everyone is all fired up and inspired by this webinar, they should immediately apply to do a THM at the Texan Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary with these two guys. I love this wise counsel. This is right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, so that's good. Great. Well, we've um, thrown around textual criticism a bit. And I have to be honest, guys, if I wanted to talk about textual criticism with my belated grandmother and she heard me use Bible and criticism in the same sentence, she would have a problem. So can you guys just help us? Uh, for one of the main goals of this webinar, I hope, is to give a general overview of textual criticism. We want to give a general overview. We want to introduce people to exciting developments in the field. And then uh, I think the meat of it is going to be exploring together some examples from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you guys are going to walk us through those with the help of a handout for which we have posted the link in the chat box. So can you guys just help us understand, you know, can you explain it like I'm five? What is textual criticism? <laughs> All right, my turn, John. Go ahead. Um, so, so real simply, the, the textual element of textual criticism refers to the text of the Bible. Uh, you can think of the interpretation of the Bible, which is really important. You can think about the theology of the Bible, which is obviously really important. But you can't have theology or interpretation if you don't know what the text says. So textual criticism is that discipline that tries to establish uh, an authoritative text that we can then interpret and use to do theology, um, to do theology from. So the reason we need to do textual criticism is because we don't have the original, uh, the, what we call the autographs of any of the biblical books. So the letter that Paul wrote to Rome, we don't have that anymore. Instead, what we have are subsequent copies of that letter. And if those all agreed exactly, then I'd be out of a job. But they don't. Uh, there's differences between them because they were copied by hand. And so textual criticism says when there's a difference in the manuscripts, we need to try to resolve that to uh, as best we can get back to what Paul wrote in the case of the New Testament. So and you want to add to you that? Mean what, you mean what Tertius wrote? Yes, what Tertius wrote with Paul's stamp of approval. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Just, just wanted to be clear there. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, so what would, you, what would you describe as the goal of textual criticism? You know, it sounds like maybe textual criticism isn't an end in itself. It sounds like people might engage in textual criticism for different reason. What, what are some of the goals of textual criticism that people bat around? Is there a debate surrounding this or is this pretty clear cut? Well, probably the debate is over what we, what text do we think we're arriving at, right? Once all that manuscript work and uh, discernment of readings that, that Peter's just describing, once all that's happened, what what text have we arrived at, right? I think that's part of one of the one of the issues. Uh, it's certainly that that text that you know Paul maybe gives his stamp of approval to, right? I don't know, I guess the field calls this what, Peter, an initial text or something, something like this. Uh, we call it the original text. Um, for the Old Testament, right, this is, this is very difficult. Um, and I think there's more debate here. Uh, I think most, mo I, I think a lot of the field is, is dedicated to uh, finding at least what, what could be called the final canonical form of the text, right? So the Old Testament, right, is formed over a millennia. That's a little different than the New Testament, right, which is quite mm -hmm. synchronic, right? It's quite over just a few decades, really. Uh, but the Old Testament is formed over like a, a thousand years, roughly. And, uh, and there, are, there are changes. There, there, there's a whole lot more scribal activity involved, right, in the production of the Old Testament. Um, one safeguard to that, though, is the fact that most of it happens in the temple or the royal courts. So there's not like people just off copying their own scriptures. There seems to be in a, in a fairly controlled 
uh, environment of the temple. Uh, look, read your Old Testament with new eyes and see just how much scribal activity happens in, the, in front of priests. Uh, Ezra, of course, is a scribal priest, right? Which is interesting. Uh, so so much, much happens there uh, in this environment. It's also the place where the manuscripts would have been stored, you know, and brought out and read. Mm -hmm. Uh, this kind of uh, context, I think, is really helpful when, when talking about uh, the history of the text of the Old Testament. So, so I think that's, that's going to continue to be a discussion. How far back are we going once text critical work is done on Old Testament books? But uh, mm -hmm. the, I think maybe what it's, what, it, what it's useful for, I mean, as a seminary professor, I, I teach textual criticism as part of my Hebrew exegesis classes. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, I, want, I want students and graduates and, and future pastors, missionaries, and counselors uh, to know just exactly what text it is they are interpreting and they are expounding and using to exhort uh, God's people or to evangelize the lost, right? So I, I, I think text criticism has a whole host of applications because it is first and foremost about establishing the text of the Bible, <laughs> Right, and I, I assume that's why we're on here, right? Because what text are we going to translate, right? So that's uh, that's a fundamental question. So, yes. anything to add to that, Peter? Uh, I just think on on the New Testament side of things, there has been a lot of discussion about the goal, and <clears throat> there's been a movement to move away from the traditional goal of of pursuing the original text, uh, and sometimes it's an attempt to say that goal is impossible or maybe not even desirable or illegitimate for whatever reason. Uh, for some people, it's more just a desire to supplement that goal and to recognize that, hey, the pursuit of the original text is not the only thing that's valuable in textual criticism, but mm -hmm. that in studying, studying manuscripts, the, those, that has its own benefits, uh, and that textual criticism in some ways is a smaller part of the larger whole that is church history, let's say. Okay, mm -hmm. and so we can study variants to help us understand the text of the Bible that people read and used to interpret and therefore did their theology from. And, you know, so that, that is really important. It's, and I always tell my students, you know, when you're reading Luther, remember, he's not reading the Nestle Elan 28, you know, mm -hmm. he's using Erasmus. And there are places where his text is different from ours in, in some mm -hmm. important ways. Um, so the term that's, that's kind of gained a lot of traction in the last 10 years in New Testament is called the initial text. And it's potentially different from the original text, but not necessarily. So it's defined usually as that text from which our extant tradition developed. So from which our manuscripts developed. And obviously that can be the author's original text, but mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be, at least not logically. So it, leaves, it, it sometimes right. leaves the door open for someone to say, I've discovered the initial text, yeah, but that's not yeah. the author's text. And then somebody else can say, well, no, I agree with you on what the initial text is, what the actual words are that make up the initial text, but I think it does go back to the authors. So right. in some right. ways, it allows for okay. greater collaboration. That's sure. one positive way of looking at it. The negative way of looking at it is that it just confuses people more. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I just want to add you, one. Oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead well, just, just no, one thing on Old Testament, just in terms of you know, if you're out reading introductions and things like this uh, on Old Testament textual criticism, you're, it, it's kind of weird. You're, you're actually not going to read a whole lot about, on the Old Testament side, about retrieving that original text. Mm -hmm. uh, the field seems more interested in tracing out what we call tradition history in some ways. So just mm -hmm. like, you know, well, how did, say, uh, Jewish Syriac Christians read the Hebrew Bible, right, by reading their famous version called the, you know, the Peshitta or something like this, right? Uh, how, how was Jerome reading the Hebrew and, and the rest of the Western church reading the Hebrew through the Latin Vulgate, you know? And it's fascinating, uh, that they're, not to say that no one's doing textual criticism in the way that we're talking about it, retrieving the original text, but so much scholarship on the, in, this, in Hebrew Bible and Old Testament does seem to be more interested in um, tradition history, so to speak. Um, sure. so, okay. so don't be confused by that if you're reading an article or a, or a, or a work on this. And, well, they're not really mm. talking about my question. Well, they may not be. So that's just right. 
something to be aware of. Right. right. Well, yeah. can you can you guys help us then with terminology? We've thrown around several terms. I've heard original. I've heard initial text. What advice would you have? Is there terminology that you would dissuade us from using? Do you would you say you know what we don't really talk like that anymore? You know, I hear original text. I hear the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic less, of course. Um, you know, people talk about canonical text, initial text. I hear people say Ausgang text. That sounds even more pretentious. Um, but do you think, uh, do, do you find all of those acceptable or are some of those kind of passe and you'd say, eh, don't really talk like that anymore? I think, I think Drew, one, one way to frame the question, and especially in the context of translation, is no matter what scholars say about what their goal is, uh, no matter how much they argue about it and discuss it, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, a translator has to print something, mm -hmm. right? So I don't care what you call it, but you have to print a text at the top of the page, don't you? Yeah. And yeah. the reality is because you're translating the Bible, and we believe this is scripture and it has authority, what you are printing will be authoritative to the people you're, you're translating for, right? Okay, so at the baseline, so I think some... Some biblical scholars actually are what they're what they are actually uncomfortable with is this idea of the text having authority, frankly. Okay, right. mm. and and mm. and I just want to say I don't care who you are, you can't avoid that question of authority, whether you're a Christian or not. Certainly not if you're a Christian. But even if you're not a Christian, the fact is anything you print, whether it's the Bible or Jane Eyre, okay, if you're mm. printing a book and somebody's reading it, they're reading that as the authority authoritative text. Mm. That is, it's authoritative for their interpretation, right? So you can't right. avoid this question. You can't sidestep this question of, of authority, even if you're a person who, for whatever reason, is uncomfortable with that. That's the right. first mm. thing I would say. Yeah. John, you want to add to that? Yeah, just, just one more thing, I guess. And I think this would apply for the New Testament as well, but it's definitely in some of the Old Testament literature uh, on textual criticism. After you've done all this work, and again, we're going to go through some guided examples here at the end, but after you've done all this work, I think that at least the one baseline assurance is we've probably arrived at a more original text, right? So, so even though we may not know exactly, like, again, mm -hmm. how, that how far back question we have, we know that we've at least arrived at a, at a far more original text than, than we had in just our, our Codex Leningrad, right? Which is the, the manuscript that the Hebrew Bible is kind of based on for us, you know? So, so I think that might just maybe one pedagogical and I, way. I think the other thing too is to say, and, and John obviously is the expert on this, so I'm going to overstep my bounds here. And <laughs> let him squash me. Um, <laughs> but at, at some level, I think we also do have to distinguish textual criticism from what might be called redaction criticism or other forms of criticism yeah. in that um, when I do text criticism of Matthew, for example, I, I think Okay, this is myself speaking. I think that Matthew used Mark's gospel. But in my textual criticism of Matthew, I'm not trying to reproduce Mark. <laughs> mm. That makes sense? So I'm not trying yeah. to do textual criticism to get back to Matthew's sources. I'm trying to get back to the text that Matthew wanted the public to read, right? Mm. Um, and so I think that's my goal in reading Matthew is what's the text that 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 Matthew wanted to read for the New Testament side, I'm more than happy to call that the original text and to continue to pursue right. that. Okay. I right. think on the New Testament side of things, we don't need to overcomplicate things and we don't necessarily help ourselves by by complicating it. Are there right. times mm -hmm. where maybe we can't be certain we've attained the original text? Of course. But that doesn't mean the goal itself is illegitimate. Right. right. Mm -hmm. You don't define sure. a goal by what you can all by the fact that you can always in every case achieve it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, changing gears a little bit, uh, textual criticism gets very technical very quickly. <laughs> and um, I, I've heard from colleagues, um, I heard when I was a student at Southeastern Seminary, I've heard from other translation consultants that, you know, textual criticism is something that is beyond most. Uh, wannabe scholars, most students of scripture. And so we're better off just leaving this to the specialists. I mean, um, there was a classicist, Hausman, who once said that textual criticism, like most other sciences, is an aristocratic affair, not communicable to all men, nor to most men. Not to be a textual criticism is no reproach to anyone unless he pretends to be what he is not. 
To be a textual critic requires aptitude for thinking and willingness to think. Um, and he goes on to say, listen, this isn't, this isn't going to be for everybody, uh, which I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Is this well, something that everybody can get involved in or is it best to just leave it to specialists? Let's first, let's first pay our respects to St. Houseman, okay? Uh, <laughs> who, who can write a sentence? Uh, it was amazing. I, I, think, I think, I'm not sure entirely if, if Hausmann wants to take text criticism away from us or give it to us, right? But in terms of saying the, the essential requirement of good textual criticism is having a good head on your shoulders, right? Having, mm -hmm. uh, having brains in your head and not a pumpkin, uh, to use his phrase. And, and I, what I would say to that degree, don't leave it to the experts. And, and part of the problem is you're gonna have to figure out who the experts are anyway. So mm. why, why, why would you think, well, I just am not gonna, not gonna even touch it. No, you've, you've gotta have some way to even judge who the experts are or not. And I'd say just much better to use the tools, resources and abilities you have been given to the best of your ability, right? You may never become a professional text critic, mm. but how, how much are you missing out on by not engaging with it is what I would say. Uh, that's mm. the better question. Mm. And I think mm -hmm. there could be quite a lot that you're missing out on. Um, yes. Besides the fact that there may be times where the experts are wrong and you using your good brains on your, your head and just thinking carefully could see a problem in the, in the way the experts have explained it. Um, that, there's that. But then also think about how, how much textual criticism requires you to engage the detail of the text, mm. which I hope is what we all want to do. Again, to whatever ability God's given us, right? Um, but that's that's one of my one of the greatest benefits I see from textual criticism is that it puts my nose in the text and forces mm -hmm. me to read it really, really carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, don't, I don't see how that could be bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think something I would just say too, just more more entry level, um, and I, I can't remember how SIL and, and Wycliffe uh, handles notes in their translations, so maybe we can talk about that down the road here, but. But at least on, in our English Bible translation, um, those who pay attention to those italicized notes at the bottom, uh, in the footnotes indicating, you know, well, this reading is based on one Hebrew manuscript, uh, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and, and uh, uh, the, the Vulgate or something like this, right, they'll give you a different reading sometimes, right? Mm. And so, so at that point, everyone has been brought into textual criticism at that point because the the, ver, the the editors of the English translation had to recognize that there was a, a difference of opinion. They went this way, uh, but there is evidence going this way, right? Going a different direction. And so everyone is kind of brought into that discussion uh, at that point. Uh, if, if they choose to just glance down at the notes, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, just this one's free. You should always read the footnotes. Okay, so always read uh, the footnotes. Yeah. That yes, like, <clears throat> so that like uh, good <laughs> that'll uh, well, uh, that'll that'll actually introduce folks to the kind of issues we're talking about a little bit high now, but but right. they they actually have grassroots kind of application. So John, so John, when I hold this in my hands, <laughs> yes, can you you know still thinking generally now? Yes. Can you can you just tell me what am I holding in my hands in the yes. in the history of people interacting with sacred scripture? Where does this stand? Has everybody had something like this? Or help yeah. me appreciate what I have here. Yeah, very briefly, this uh, Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, uh, probably printing five. Um, represents the text, not necessarily the layout, but the text of the manuscript we call popularly Codex Leningrad, whose colophon at the end dates it to 1008 AD. That's what you're holding right here. Mm. The text that is printed here is the text of the manuscript, even with some of the, uh, what we call the Masora notes here out on, in the margin. Now, of course, they didn't have this little apparatus here at the bottom. That's, these are modern editors who are uh, offering opinion as to whether the text in that manuscript is 
uh, original or not, or whether we should read with some other source or conjecture. Mm -hmm. Does that make does that make sense? So, yeah. so this is what we call the the fancy term for this is that it's a diplomatic text. It prints the text of one manuscript and then reports all variations or variants uh, down in its apparatus at the bottom. So that's okay. what we, so no, not, not everyone has held this. <laughs> um, okay. okay, the so manuscript did itself. Jesus, did Jesus, oh, did for Jesus? Example, hold something like that? <laughs> I don't think Jesus held a codex. I, I think probably more a scroll might be the, uh, the, the medium mm -hmm. to talk about there. <laughs> Yeah. But yes, okay, no, that's right. But so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what, what this is. So that means, right, and maybe you can, Peter should talk about the New Testament edition, because they are very different. This is one manuscript uh, with variants recorded, uh, which means there's a whole lot of textual criticism of the Old Testament to do. That's really what mm -hmm. that means. Yeah. Okay, so we're essentially... Lot this essentially represents one manuscript. Okay, so how is that different than this, Peter? I've got um, what we call the U United Bible Society's New Testament, Greek New Testament, fifth edition, revised edition here in front of me. How is that different? Can you help me appreciate what I'm holding when I hold this? Have other Christians throughout the centuries from Tertius's day to my day been able to hold something like this? Um... <clears throat> No, oh, oh man. Okay, I'm gonna sidestep that form of the question, Drew, just because it's, <laughs> that's too much of a rabbit hole. Um, right. that, would get me, that, that could get me into anything from fonts to to formatting. <laughs> so I'm gonna avoid that. Um, so, what, but what this is, this is a a modern scholarly attempt to get back as close as we can to the original text. Okay, so um, and in particular, this is a UBS five edition, so it's probably the most popular among translators. It was designed specifically for translators in the field. And one of the things it does to help translators is it reduces the number of variants that it gives in the apparatus. And for those that are interested um, to know the next editions of this, I'm told will have even fewer variants because mm -hmm. the, the word that the editors have heard from translators in the field is that it's still too many. It's still more than they really mm -hmm. even need to consider. Okay, mm -hmm. um, So maybe we could talk about that later but that's at least what I've heard, okay? Um, so within that, they also give you a rating for each reading that they prefer, and from A to D, A being their most confident, and then D being their least confident. And uh, you should probably know that over the, over the years, from the first edition to the f at least the fourth edition, uh, there's a notable trend of greater confidence on their part, hmm. okay? So you can actually track the letter grades and they go, they tend to go up. There's a bit of inflation oh, right. if you want to look at it that way, okay? Um, we can talk about maybe why that is, but, um, but no, so what you're holding here is a, a scholarly reconstruction of what they think the original text is. This is not the text of one particular manuscript like you're dealing with with BHS for the Old Testament, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes BHS is called a diplomatic text. Uh, mm -hmm. This is called an eclectic text, meaning they have picked readings from different manuscripts depending on how they think they That's right. uh, yeah. attest the original text or not. Okay, and so how then is how then is this Greek New Testament different from Greek New Testaments that started being printed, say, 500 years ago? Okay, so, so your first printed Greek New Testament, uh, well, your, your first printed is the Complutensian, but your first published is Erasmus's, and Erasmus is working from a handful of manuscripts that he has access to, and you can, you can actually go online and see some of the manuscripts. You can see the main manuscript that he used with his own handwritten notes in the margins sometimes mm. for the printer, right? So think about this. The first printed books all had to come from something. What do they come from? They come from handwritten manuscripts, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what Erasmus does. So we, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so you actually see some places where Erasmus introduces uh, readings that are either unattested or not very well attested in, in actual manuscripts that we now know about, but it's because he was marking up his, his own manuscript for the printer, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so then from that, Erasmus's edition becomes kind of the foundation for editions for, goodness, the next couple hundred years of printed Greek New Testaments. And then in the 17th, really the 8th, into the 
18th century and especially the 19th century, uh, New Testament scholars begin to study manuscripts more. They begin, they begin to have access to more, more and earlier and better manuscripts, and they start to realize, hey, the text represented in all our printed editions actually represents a later text overall, and we should use these earlier manuscripts to try to get back farther. And mm -hmm. so that begins to change then, with, change then with people like Karl Lachmann, and then probably most famously, Westcott and Hort in 1881. And then really from that point on, uh, Bible translations are, especially English Bible translations, are done from an eclectic Greek New Testament text. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for that, for that wonderful overview. Um, at working in local language Bible translation today, I love to see the work that I'm doing with local communities translating the Bible in this long line of um, interpreters and translators, those who are interacting with this, uh, this sacred text. Um, and there seems to be an expectation, at least in our age, that sacred texts don't change that my Bible is my Bible, is my grandmother's Bible, is her grandmother's Bible, all the way back to Jesus's Bible, it's, it's, et cetera, that this text does not change. Um, how does this square with ancient expectations of sacred texts? Or it sounded, John, like when you were describing um, BHS, it sounded like you were almost hinting at there being maybe multiple streams of sacred text tradition. Um, whereas today, I'm used to say one tradition for the Greek New Testament and mostly one tradition when it comes to the, the Old Testament. Now, of course, Greek Orthodox communities, they'll be more accustomed to say the Septuagint as their Old Testament sacred text. But where I grew up in Protestantism, you know, this was kind of held up as a sacred text. So I don't know, what can you guys, how can you guys help us understand maybe different, or different perspectives concerning sacred texts today versus in past generations? Yeah, that's, uh, that okay. could take the whole day. Uh, <laughs> well, keep it short, keep it short. Because okay, I me, love this. This is me, one of my favorite areas. Let, uh, me, let me start with one, one observation. That is, <laughs> Wait, can we, go to the, can we go to the Hebrew Bible first? Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll go to the, the first. first. Well, no, okay, let me say this. because this The is First over, Testament. This yes. is an overarching thing. Two-thirds of the Bible. There's Talk about the two-thirds first. <laughs> new, new and better covenant. New right? and better okay. testament. Um, <laughs> also known as the appendix covenant. to this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we'll sort this out later. But um, <laughs> there's potential ambiguity in the word text that we do need to think about a little bit before we get rolling, okay? because text can refer to something printed like this. This is my text, yeah? But text can also be something that's immaterial, right? So I can refer to the text of Matthew and I may have something in my head and I know that means the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> right? And I know what the Sermon on the Mount says, even if I can't say it verbatim, right? So you need to think a little bit about the potential ambiguity of text. So when we say do text change, there's a sense in which, yes, of course they change. And there's another sense in which, well, but. Matthew has always been recognizable as Matthew. Yeah, does that mm. make sense? So, so his mm. gospel has always been recognizable as distinct from Mark, even though they share a lot of the same words in common. Mm. Yeah, okay. So just start with that. And then okay. Right. Ahead. right. Um, <laughs> so I let me- Did I help me, or um, I mess you up, John? Let, no, no, let me, let, me just start, <laughs> let me just start with quoting the, uh, the, the early father, Origen, um, from around, 240 AD. Origen was, you know, of course, a, a famous theologian, philosopher. He's also an ancient grammarian or philologist in the Alexandrian school of, say, Zenodotus, Aristarchus, right? These grammarians who were working on uh, the works of Homer, right? The, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, doing textual work on their sacred works, right, of Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Origen learns a, a number of these uh, grammatical techniques. Some we would even just flat out translate textual criticism. Uh, the, the Greek term is deorthosis. He's doing correction on copies hmm. of texts. Can we make a distinction between copies and texts? Maybe we can. So, uh, so, so he, he's aware, say, for the book of Exodus, that there are 
uh, copies uh, in Hebrew, and there are copies uh, in Greek. And for Exodus 35 to 40, the famous, uh, you know, uh, building and uh, uh, plans and building for the tabernacle, uh, there, are, there are major differences between the, Septu the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew manuscripts that we have and origin around 240 AD is commenting on the same differences that we can now see today, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But some of the differences are like blocks of instruction are, mm -hmm. are what we call transposed, okay? They're, they're flipped around to the point where, where origin says something like, the, 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 the tabernacle narrative seems to like come from two minds. So, mm. so that's just how different some of these are. But here's the deal. Early Christians have known about them for a very long, well, early, early Christians knew about them, and we've known about them for, for a very long time, you see. Uh, this wasn't like a cause to leave the faith or, or something like right. this. You know, do we have two erection of the tabernacle narratives? Not quite. It's recognizable that this is the building of the tabernacle, to go to Peter's point, mm -hmm. but they are very different. Uh, and so, so Origen actually went to work as an ancient grammarian or corrector and actually uh, began to modify the, sept the copies in the Greek to align more with the Hebrew copies in his day, you see. This is what's called the hexapla. This would also take us a semester to unpack. So we're not going to go down that road. We're not going to go down that road. But just, I, I think this goes to your point, though. How have Christians over the centuries dealt with these problems? Well, they've done, they've done correction on the copies. Hmm. They, they, and hmm. I think we've gotten better at it uh, since origin, even. Uh, but, but, but that's basically what's happening today is what they were doing. There were differences in the copies of these texts, mm. and we had to come up with there... some kind of authoritative addition for them. Mm. Yeah. But John, was there ever a time where people were more tolerant of multiple streams, or have, have um, scholarly minds always sought to correct and s search a certain amount of uniformity, or do you think people in the past may have been more tolerant of multiple streams? Well, I would say this. I, I think there's always been a tendency, as far as my memory, as far as my knowledge goes, I think there's always been a tendency to do this correction, okay? Mm. That's not to say we're going to erase and burn say, alternative copies. Mm -hmm. That's not what they did. Uh, the methods that they used, you can actually trace kind of the sources and, or the streams that you're talking about uh, in the edition that they would have held. The hexapla uh, and, and later what's known as the tetrapla, uh, Origen actually kind of could tell a narrative from what he produced of the, of the history of the text, or at least the textual variation all the while saying this is the corrected scholarly edition that I'm going to use in my mm. teaching and preaching uh, and, and in my dialogues with, with the Jews in Caesarea. Okay. You know? does, that, does that make sense? So, so yeah, I think there's yeah. always been this tendency to do correction, uh, mm -hmm. but kind of leaving footnotes, so to speak, so you can kind of piece right. together the rest of the story. Okay. I think I it's like note. But Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's probably fair to say, and John, you can uh, do what you want with this. Uh, but, <laughs> but um, I think it's fair to say that before the inventing of the print printing press, most serious and certainly educated readers, let's call them educated readers, okay, uh, the kind of people that that left literary works that we can now read, like Origen and Augustine and people like that, okay, they're never surprised to find that there are mistakes in their copies. Right. Right. They, they never are because they live in a world of, ha of handwriting. And so mm -hmm. for them to, to have a copy of any literary work that has no mistakes would have been like, well, no, of course there'll be some that I need to fix. Right, right, right. right. And hmm. yet at the same time, that doesn't mean that they were just okay with any old change being made to their text of scripture, hmm. right? So hmm. it's, it's possible for them to, on the one hand, not ever be surprised to find mistakes in their copies. And on the other hand, to not be okay with all mistakes that they find. Right. Sure. Makes, so you can find right. them complaining about them, right? Oh yeah, totally. No, and I just to go to that point too. They, I mean, Origen and others. I mean, they do lament sloppy scribes. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Mm -hmm. For sure. And right. and they realize that 
the vast majority of the vulgar common texts of their day, copies of their day, uh, were copied sloppily. And, and they wow. actually outlined several, several reasons for a, a, a bad scribe, you know. And, and the reason um, I think this is important is, be, is Drew, is because some, peop some people have a tendency to say, well, when, when the printing press is invented, that changes the way people think about texts. Right. And mm -hmm. that it's not until the invention of the printing press that people are worried about textual variants. And, hmm. you, you know, you just don't have to spend much time with the church files to realize that's nonsense. Of course, right. they were bothered they were by textual variants, okay. right? Yeah. But I oh, think right. what the printing press does change is that for the first time, people can be surprised to discover that there are differences. Mm. Do you see? Right. Because Higher when you're in a world where you're only books. ever reading handwritten copies, you're never surprised yeah. to find mistakes, right? right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But when you're living in yeah. a world where everybody else's Bible looks the exact same as yours, literally down to the typeface, and then you yeah. discover their variants, now suddenly you are in a world where you can be surprised. Does that make right. sense? Okay. So yes. I think that's maybe the helpful way to think about the way the printing press has, has right. shaped. Okay, excellent. Well, I, I wanna keep us moving here. Um, John, please tell us what is happening in the field of Old Testament textual criticism. Is there anything exciting happening? Um, what, what's going on? Well, you did That's mention it. it already, Drew. So, <laughs> so, so, so this, this is probably uh, one of the advances in Old Testament textual criticism right now. Um, the last critical edition of Orig the remains of Origen's Hexapla, his six-columned Bible. The last edition mm -hmm. was done in 1875. Wow. Um, and so uh, well over, you know, 100 years ago, coming up on 150 years, I guess. Um, so, so what this does is it advances our knowledge of Jewish Greek versions from the first and second mm -hmm. centuries AD. So not, not the Septuagint, which is the popular Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, okay, which were pretty much all done right before or, or around the time of Jesus, but, but kind of just after the time of Jesus into the second century, there were three Jews named Oculusimachus and Theodosian who were making mm -hmm. revisions of the Septuagint in Greek. Revisions to mm. what, you say? You have to always revise towards something. Well, they're revising towards this Hebrew text that we've been talking about. But they're also giving you, like, different interpretations. So uh, Isaiah 7.14 is a good example. The, 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 Greek transla this, the popular Greek translation has, you know, behold, the virgin, the Parthenos, will conceive mm -hmm. and give birth to a son. Uh, Aquila, Symmachus, and Theodotion... Uh, retranslated the Hebrew word Alma, which is, there's some debate, right, about what the Hebrew word Alma means, but uh, the three, as they're often called, Akula, Simicus, Theodosian, they revised Parthenos with the Greek word Neonis, or young woman. Behold, the young woman will conceive and give birth to a son. You see, so uh, implying in the, no, in the normal, natural way of things, right? Mm. So, so uh, what this is doing is it's actually giving us some insight as to how Jews were reading the Hebrew scriptures in the first and second centuries, and we don't have a lot of evidence for the, the state of the Hebrew text in that time period. In fact, we have very little. We have some manuscripts from Qumran that, that are dated to the first century uh, and, and maybe just after, but after Bar Kokhba, 132 AD, there's no, more, there's no more Hebrew scribal work going on in the land, but there are these mm. Jewish revisers who are, who are revising and translating the Hebrew scriptures that they had, right, into, into Greek that is more interpretively palatable for the synagogue, okay? Mm. Um, just one last little snippet, and then I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop here, because there's actually, so, I mean, there's so much we could say. This is just probably in my wheelhouse. Yeah. But in, yeah. I, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, uh, Paul quotes Isaiah 25, 8, that death will be swallowed up in victory. And uh, it's clear to me and to others that Paul is not citing the, the Greek Septuagint. He's not making his own translation of the Hebrew, 
he's actually mm. citing the Jewish version of Theodosian right there mm. of Isaiah mm. 25, verse 8 there. And so uh, clearly these, these, these versions are around. They, they, they definitely give us great insights into the state of the Hebrew text and also its interpretation uh, right mm. in and around of the, of the time of Jesus and the apostles. Okay. So, um, so to me, that's, uh, unfortunately, the hexapla of origin was never copied fully. So the work of mm. editing is, is, wor is editing the fragments or the remains wow. uh, of this wow. text. So, wow. um, that's, yeah. Yeah. Sounds but, rather onerous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's well, move in. Let's move into the New Testament. Peter, what can you tell us? What's popping in New Testament textual criticism? Anything exciting happening? Or are we, we've got our New Testament, we're done, we're doing other things now? Or what's, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, you know, there's a sense from some that kind of, well, aren't we done? That's it. Everything's been done. But uh, no, the major projects going on right now is, is probably this one called the Adidio Critica Maior, or Latin for the Major Critical Edition. Uh, this is the volume on the Catholic letters, which is um, what I like to call the letters not written by Paul in the New Testament. And, uh, and then Acts is out, and they are working on Mark and John and uh, Paul's letters and Revelation right now as well. And it's a major, it's a, the, the biggest edition that's been done of the New Testament probably for 100 plus years. Uh, wow. Well over 100 years, probably. Yeah. So if we got, if, if between the fourth and the fifth edition of this, we got 34 changes, yep. the next edition, do you know when the next edition of the UBS Greek New Testament is supposed to come out? Do you expect there will be lots of changes? I, I think at one point, I, you know, these, these dates have a way of changing, okay, and, and COVID has probably changed them more. Um, originally, I think they were saying 2022 for maybe a new edition. Last I heard, they wanted to have at least two new books to include in the next one. Mm -hmm. So the UBS 5 has a new text of the Catholic letters. They have a new text of Acts in the ECM now. But when I talked to the director the last time, he said they wanted to have at least one other book besides Acts mm -hmm. to include. So I think they'll probably wait for Mark, which, is, which is, sounds like right. it's going to be the next one done. And then hopefully okay. John after that. So I would say look for another one in the next five years, maybe. Um, okay. And look for it to include probably at least Acts and Mark, and we'll see if it includes John or, or not. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of things that are changing. As, as I mentioned, the text, most of those 34 changes in the Catholic letters are pretty small, pretty minor. You couldn't, couldn't really get them into a translation, probably. Um, mm -hmm. It wouldn't need to. Um, but then the other thing is you should be aware that the, the variants they list in the apparatus are changing and the manuscripts they're citing are changing. So as a result of all this work for the ECM, they're, they're, they're discovering that, well, manuscripts that we didn't think were very important before are turning out to be more important than we thought before, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and other manuscripts that we thought were more important now turn out to be less, less important. Mm -hmm. So the manuscripts that are actually cited in your apparatus are changing, as are some of the variants. Some, some are getting dropped, some are getting added. Okay, mm -hmm. and then of course decisions are are being made differently than the last go around. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, yeah. And then of course the, no. the the other big change with that with the ECM is what's called the CBGM because we like acronyms in New Testament text criticism, uh, <laughs> which stands for the Coherence Based Genealogical Method, um, which is the longest name ever. Uh, but that's a way of using leveraging computers to help us track the differences in manuscripts and then track our own decisions across thousands mm -hmm. of places and then allow those changes to help us see the big picture and then adjust some of our decisions in the details. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the 10,000 foot view anyway of that. Okay. Okay. Same so it about. sounds like in both the old and new Testament, we can expect um, exciting developments, um, perhaps confirmation of things that were less certain in the past, perhaps suggestions of a new um, initial text that we should be reading in certain instances. So it kind of demands that we be um, a little bit flexible and be willing to interact with and um, yeah. kind of be open to multiple streams and different ideas coming in. Right. So, all right. I would just say, Drew, before you, I know you want to move on. It's just a really exciting time. 
to work mm. in these areas in both Old and New Testament. There's mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. I mean, new analyses, but but I just feel like new evidence sets, new 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 mm -hmm. manuscripts being discovered, um, or like old manuscripts that we've had that we can now open virtually. Right. 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 I mean, there's just there's so many new things happening in this field. Um, so yeah, it's, so, so that's, that's great for us and we're trying to stay on top of it all. I, I realize that can be daunting for others who are interested, mm -hmm. but man, how do, where do I even begin and how do I, how do I stay on top of the, of, of some of the developments that are happening? Mm -hmm. um, that is one of the things the TCI is trying to do, right? Is trying to make these kinds of things known uh, and, right. and, and, and trying to disseminate, so. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, shifting into um, translation, more translation related issues, we're going to get to these examples really soon here. Um, translation. So the interaction of textual criticism and translation Our our last webinar, we interviewed perhaps one of the most um, uh, famous translation consultants in our family of organizations, uh, Dr. Barnwell. And um, she said that she still feels like after decades of working as a translation consultant that textual criticism is perhaps her biggest blind spot still, where she feels like she needs the most help. Um, and I know that many of us on the field, we feel that way. So we're so grateful for what you guys are doing as well as others in preparing editions like this to offer, offer greater uh, guidance on, on, um, on textual matters. You know, a couple um, uh, instances stick out to me in my short career working in Bible translation. You know, I remember um, shortly after I arrived in Central Africa, working with the team, helping them prepare their Gospel of Mark. And um, the standard United Bible Society's advice is when you get to the ending of Mark, you ought to put Mark in some sort of brackets or indicate in some way that this is most likely not original for the ending. And um, the translators looked at me and said, you are trying to undermine God's word. We cannot put brackets in here. We cannot put this. We cannot put a note saying this is probably not original. You are trying to undermine God's work. Now, I was really taken aback because here I was, you know, a new young missionary having prepared to come help with Bible translation. I was all excited. And here I am being accused of undermining God's work. How would you, you know, just in a couple sentences, how would you guys, how would you assuage this sort of discomfort? Yeah. I think on that one, uh, I would probably not fight that battle um, mm -hmm. because if, it, and, and, and here's what I mean by that. Think about the, how long it's taken for Western scholarship to get to the point where it's really easy for the UBS to just say, oh, just put brackets around it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and here you are, if I can put it this way, you're kind of, uh, uh, you know, parachuting into this translation team. <laughs> you're the outsider. Yeah. And here yes. you are, you're going to just tell them in 10 minutes that, oh, yeah, exactly. just put brackets around this part of the Bible. Yeah. No. Don't do that, yeah. you know, so just don't Not do that. that. Simple. The, the church yeah. has read this text for two millennia mm -hmm. as God's word. Aside from a small area in Appalachia, it has caused no problems for people, <laughs> right? So, yes. so just, just relax. The, the Lord is bigger. He can handle it, right? <laughs> uh, yes. and, and let them, let them come to that conclusion in, in due time. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think and that's even assuming, okay, assuming that it's not original, which I do, I think, but then also assuming that it's not canonical, which I do think is a slightly different question than whether or not it's original, mm. at least in that case. Mm. Okay. In most mm. cases, I wouldn't distinguish those questions, but there, I think we might. Okay. So I, I think that would be my short answer there. There's a tendency in translation to be conservative, and I don't think that's always bad. Our goal yes. with the Bible shouldn't be, I mean, you know, we just talked about the exciting developments in text criticism, and they are exciting, mm -hmm. but we also ought not to be out to just change the Bible because it's fun, no. right? Yeah. And, and hopefully yeah. no translator wants to do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, uh, that, that would be my short answer on, on that. Um, yeah, you know, and I think you've highlighted something very important. You know, our family of organizations being involved in local Bible translation, we want to be very sensitive to um, concerns and the socio-religious context in which we're working. You know, I see myself as coming alongside translators, helping them accomplish the goals for their project, not that I have a project to impose on them. So I, I'm certainly open to the most appropriate way to engage with these sorts of questions. So I, I really 
appreciate your answer. Well, um, I have loads of other things I wanted to kind of address here with translation, but let's go ahead and get into these juicy examples. So I hope everybody, um, I hope everybody has access to our handout. Um, is it backwards to start with the New Testament? Oh, to translate from the New Testament. No, no, no. I mean, to treat, for us to walk through New Testament examples first. Is this backwards? Oh, or should we start with oh, 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 that's funny. Oh. Yeah. I, I was thinking we should alternate so oh, that we get to at good. least some of each. All right, let's but, do that. All right. So, so Peter, why don't you help us tackle, um, why don't you help us tackle Mark 1? So I hope everybody has the handout here. Um, we're going to take a look at Mark 1. Um, in the handout, the digital handout that I've prepared for everyone and given you a link to, you'll find the UBS Greek New Testament edition 5 in the first column, then the New Revised Standard Version, and then the Christian Standard Bible, and then the Common English Bible, the columns there, and then you'll see the textual notes. So I'm hoping, Peter, you can help walk us through this and understand what we're seeing here, and sure. just give us kind of what your preference would be. Okay, sure. So uh, great. First of all, thanks, Drew, for putting this together. It's really helpful to have this all in one place and not to go hunting for all this stuff. Um, so, okay, first thing you see in the UBS apparatus there is you see in those curly brackets, you see the letter C, okay? So that would tells, you read the text for us? Would you oh, read the text for us? Yeah, yeah. In Greek or English, what do you want? Whatever, whatever speaks to you. I feel like I'm, feel like I'm being tested here. Uh, okay, so the text here is Arche tu Evangelio, Jesu Christu Huiu Theu, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And in the UBS mm -hmm. text, the words Son of God, Huiu Theu, are in brackets. And brackets mark places where the editors are not completely convinced of the originality of the text inside the brackets. Okay, uh, one of the changes that's coming in the UBS is that in the parts that have been updated, so for now, just the Catholic letters, they're doing away with brackets altogether. And instead they're using a new symbol that's a diamond and the diamond shows greater uncertainty than the brackets do, okay? So mm -hmm. both of them mark uncertainty, but the diamond is places where as editors, they're saying, we actually refuse to decide for you. We don't know. Mm -hmm. They have to pick one to print up top, okay? But in the Adidio Critica Mai or in the ECM, they'll actually split the text line there at that point as a way of saying, mm -hmm. we're not going to decide. It's a, you know, we, we right. were torn. Okay. okay? Um, so, so just keep that in mind. These brackets are going to go away. Whether they will print huiu theu, we don't know with the diamond or not. We right. don't know. Okay. We have to okay. But it's in brackets here. And then in the, in the apparatus, you'll see they give it a rating of C, showing this is a, a pretty decent level of uncertainty on their part. Okay, D, D is the only reading that would be more uncertain for them. And we have uh, essentially two readings, okay? We have a number of sub variations within this given the article, okay? Um, <clears throat> but the main choice is between whether huiu theu is there or not, okay? Okay. And as the, the commentary that you've, you've quoted there notes, uh, in the earliest manuscripts, really in, goodness, in this case, probably all manuscripts, the, the, the words Yesu, Christu, Huiu, and Theu would all be abbreviated as what we call nomina sacra, that is sacred names, okay? And the typical way of doing a nomina, a, a nomen sacrum, a sacred name, is to take the first and last letter and then write a line over it in the manuscript, hmm. okay? Which means what you have here in most manuscripts that have the longer reading, you have Uangeliu, which ends with Omicron Upsilon, then you have an iota upsilon, then a key upsilon, then an upsilon upsilon, and then a theta upsilon. That's okay. a lot of oops. And if long, yeah. even if you don't know Greek, you know that's a lot of upsilons, okay? Yeah. And so that makes it really easy to accidentally leave some of those words out mm -hmm. uh, as a scribe by, by thinking you've copied everything because you're looking at your new fresh copy that you're making and you see a lot of upsilons there. <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. and so your, your, your mind plays a bit of tricks on you, okay? So one argument mm -hmm. is that the, the phrase son of God was left out by accident as a simple scribal error, okay? Right. The kind of scribal error we find in every single manuscript, okay? Mm -hmm. On the other side, the argument is that scribes sometimes expanded the titles for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we do have evidence of this, where for example, our best manuscripts will have Jesus, but then other manuscripts will add Christ to that, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we do know that scribes have a notable tendency to sometimes expand titles of Jesus. Okay, so that's the basic debate there. And everything I've described so far is what we call internal evidence. That is, we haven't considered at all yet which manuscripts have which reading. We're just thinking mm. about what scribes are likely right. to have done, right? Right. Here's what we know from, from manuscripts, okay? Okay. All right, uh, what else should we say? The other thing we should say is that uh, the sonship of Jesus is, a, is an important theme in Mark's gospel. Okay? Hmm. It comes up later in chapter one at the baptism when Jesus comes out of the water and the voice says, this is my beloved son. And then the next people to say that Jesus is the son of God are the opponents of Jesus, the demons in particular, right? And then a few other people, it comes up again, it comes up in the trial scene in Mark's gospel. And then it comes up climactically on the lips of the centurion at the crucifixion, where he mm -hmm. sees the way Jesus dies, and he says, surely this man was the Son of God, okay? Mm -hmm. So there can be no doubt that the sonship of Jesus is an important theme in Mark's important. gospel. But then some people might think, well, maybe that's why scribes would add it at the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. They know Mark's gospel very well, as many Christian scribes did. And so it was an easy addition for them to say, well, this isn't just the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. It's Jesus right. Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Right. All right. Thus um, the level of uncertainty. Yes. That's right. Thus the level of uncertainty. That's right. Okay. For my take, okay, yep. uh, we have very good manuscript evidence in support of the longer reading with Son of God. Okay. okay, we have a correction in Sinaiticus. So the, the first hand of Sinaiticus has the shorter reading. Our earliest witness actually is not listed in your apparatus. It's actually a, an amulet that is just the first line of Mark's gospel. An amulet is a little, little strip of papyrus they would fold up and wear sometimes as like a necklace right. to ward off evil spirits. Yeah. Okay, um, and it does not have the longer reading. Okay, hmm. um, but by the time we get to Vaticanus, which is B, and then D, which is Codex Bezae, uh, we have uh, the longer reading, and then that's the reading we find in the majority of manuscripts, in most of the ver early versions, and a lot of church fathers, okay? Um, so, for my take, I think probably <clears throat> the longer reading is original here, and that's because okay. we can find clear examples of manuscripts where the scribe left this, these two words out and it's clear it's accidental because he's corrected it in the margin. And for example, that there's a manuscript I, I happened to look at in Italy one time. It's complete New Testament and the scribe made this same type of mistake on every single page. Every mm. single page he left out words or phrases because they shared similar letters with the words before it. Wow. And then he, made, he, he did a good job. He went back and checked himself and, and oftentimes rewrote it in the margin. And sure enough, on the first page of Mark's gospel, he did that twice, once here wow. in the very first verse, and then later in later, about 10 verses later, right? So that's just a clear example of where I can say with, with really strong confidence that scribe left these words out by accident. And if that later mm -hmm. scribe could do it, then an early scribe could do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And that to okay. me seems like the much simpler explanation for this variation. Okay. Does that make so sense? In in the Peter Gurry ver version, you're printing it, you're printing Son of yep. God. I was looking at the NS NRSV, I see that yeah. they've put um, a note, a footnote saying other ancient authorities lack the Son of God. Now, as a translation consultant, I find the phrasing, the terminology ancient authorities very problematic because yeah. to me, that seems to imply um, people, as in government officials yeah. said that you know, government officials left this out or something like that is, you know, what, what do you yeah. find, what would you put as a footnote here? What would you recommend as footnote text? I see the uh, Christian standard Bible says some manuscripts omit the son of God. What would, yeah. would you put a footnote? Would you just leave it? And that's, that's above my pay grade, Drew. So, <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. 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 Here's, um, I, don't know, I don't know if this makes sense, but yeah. here's a local, version that they have Zwanga Lasglafta, son of God, no brackets, no right. footnote, no nothing. Right. They just print it. Yeah. They've got no footnote. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. just they're going for it. So that's right. um and for I, me that's fine. Yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. I, I for for my own sake, I feel confident enough that I would be happy not to put a footnote, honestly. 
Um, it's partly a larger question of what the footnotes are designed to accomplish, how many you want to have overall, what kind of access does your audience have to, to larger scholarship, mm -hmm. right? If they have none at all, yeah. It, yeah. it's actually almost, almost makes the question harder, right? Because then you put the footnote in and they have nothing to follow that up with. So you, 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 you yeah. raise questions that they didn't, don't have the resources to even answer in any, any helpful way. Um, on the other hand, by not putting it, then do you create greater distrust and confusion when they later find out there is a variant there, right? Yeah. So it's a bit of a, it's, there's, there's important questions yeah. on, on various sides. For my sake, I'd probably be fine not putting a note in this case if I was aiming for fewer notes. If I was right. aiming for comfortable notes, I'm happy to put one in as well. Right. Okay. Okay. So I, I will. Right. Well, thank, yeah. thank you so much. All right, John, do you want to spin the, um, the, the, the wheel of fortune for Old Testament variants and let us know which one we're going to go to here? <laughs> oh, man, they're all good. Uh, a lot of it depends on how much time we think we have. Let, let's maybe quickly discuss the Genesis 4-8. I don't think it will take uh, forever. So it's the first oh. one, I think, in the Old Testament. Yep. So if everybody scrolls down, so if everybody has the um, digital handout web page open, just scroll down after all the New Testament examples, you'll find the Hebrew Bible, First Testament, Old Testament examples, Genesis yeah. 4, 8, where we're going. All right, take us away. That's right. So I'll just give a translation, uh, though it's rough because of the, the issue that we're going to discuss. So in Cain okay. said to Abel, or Hevel, his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Hevel, his brother, and he killed him. Okay. And uh, that's, that's a, just a translation of the Hebrew text right out of Codex Leningrad, right, in the, in the BHS, right? Uh, but there's a, there's a footnote there in the BHS. And uh, Drew has nicely supplied the BHS apparatus uh, below. And uh, it's noting that multiple manuscripts and editions uh, have an interval here. That is a, a, a punctuation uh, after the little word, his brother, okay? And uh, I, again, I think some of that is just, they're just noting that there's a little bit of a problem here, okay? But they, they, the major punctuation in the Masoretic accents uh, is there on his brother, like, pause, full stop, or semicolon type stop, okay, uh, there. And then after the semicolon, after the, the, the Latin word abbreviation interv, we've got the uh, Latin abbreviations for perhaps insert, and they actually supply the Hebrew reading, nelaka hasadeh, which would be translated, let us go out to the field, Hmm. So perhaps insert, let us go out to the field. The little C uh, is for the Latin cum with the Samar uh, a version known as the Samaritan Pentateuch, mm -hmm. right? The version that uh, the woman at, at, at uh, the well, right? That Jesus meets, right? In John mm -hmm. 4, she's reading the Samaritan Pentateuch, no doubt, Okay. And uh, so, so the Samaritan Pentateuch has this, let us go out into the field. The, 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 the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, another version known as the Syriac Peshitta and the Latin Vulgate, as well as a couple of witnesses to what is known as the Aramaic Targum, uh, Jonathan. Mm. So that's a mouthful. And what, what's important to realize here is that there's actually no Hebrew manuscripts that have this hmm. reading. Wow. All that the BHS apparatus is reporting here is, uh, is the evidence of ancient versions. That is, ancient translations have supplied uh, some type of equivalent for let us go out into the field. Now, BHS gives a probability remark here, perhaps supply the text, let us go out into the field uh, with, because there's so many ancient versions that have this, okay? But uh, this is, and this is where the debate begins. As you can see, the, our, our major English, some of our major English translations have just added, let's go out to the field. Of course, noting it with a footnote that they've deviated from the Hebrew text that they're normally translating. Mm -hmm. They, they give the evidence of what they're translating in this 
particular place. Um, but the, the, the Jewish Publication Society, the New Jewish Publication Society, simply omits the text because it wow. doesn't agree with the Hebrew manuscripts. Right. So this one is, is a bit of a crux. Uh, there's no great way to explain how that longer reading would be omitted. Okay, so we're talking about now, what is a scribe likely to do here? Okay, there's actually, uh, there's not like similar letters involved. Okay, there's not really a great mechanism by which a scribe's eye might skip from one word to another word and leave out those two words, let, let us go out into the field. There, there, there's not that kind of explanation. You, you could argue that it was there originally, that somehow the, one of the manuscripts became corrupt, and, and, and there was a mutilation to the manuscript. And, uh, and that, that omission then was copied, okay, through the Middle Ages all the way to our received text. You could, you could make that kind of argument. Uh, or um, the, clearly the more difficult reading is the Hebrew text. And what right. you could argue is that ancient translators, you're gonna love this one, Drew, ancient translators are trying to make the text readable and understandable. So, so, so they have to supply uh, the, 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 what did Cain say to Abel, his brother? Well, he said, mm -hmm. let us go out into the field. That has them in the field now. And when yeah. they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel and mm -hmm. killed him, right? So, so you kind of see, uh, and, and again, the more familiar you, you become with ancient translations, you'll see that they're not always representing word for word, letter for letter. Now, some of them do, but not all of them do. Mm -hmm. And many ancient mm -hmm. versions uh, are not uh, even going to flinch when they add an expression that's going to help the text become right. uh, slightly more understandable. Right. right, especially in this case, you know, it, it seems to concern a hidden event or implicit right. information. All of a sudden you have these people in the field which presupposes somebody said to somebody let's go right. out to the field so exactly exactly explicit that's, kind of making hidden events come out that's okay. right so they're how is the john mead bible gonna gonna read here yeah so i think uh i'm actually okay with um with the way most of these have handled it if there's a note the reason why i like the note is because I, I don't want people to be too confused about where some of these readings are coming from uh, if, they're, if, if they're sort of asked about it at times. I, I, and and I'm, I'm, this is the scholar in me, and I, I like footnotes probably too much. Right. So, yeah. um, but that's just my tendency here. So I, I kind of like how the CSB has handled it, for example. Right. So. And what do you think about the wording of the footnotes here? Um, you know, <laughs> the uh, Jewish Publication Society, ancient versions, including the Targum, that seems to be relatively accessible. But as soon as I start seeing the Common English Bible and CSB with all these abbreviations, it kind of, it seems a bit heavy, especially thinking yeah. of um, yeah. local. No, no, that's words. true. I, and I, I, I do, I want to work on some more bridge building there to make some of those mm -hmm. notes more accessible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do know, like, if you say the ESV study Bible, a study Bible, mm -hmm has the luxury of explaining this in short articles at the beginning. Actually, all right. these versions are explained uh, at the beginning of a study Bible like that one. But, uh, but no, you're right. Uh, they can be very off-putting and, uh, and, and just opaque, right, at the end of the day. Yeah. But, okay. um, but no, I, but I do agree basically with the B rating of the, of the Hebrew textual commentary there. I, I think the MT probably is original maybe it it's as well represents a corruption but i don't think the versions uh represent a more original text than mt at this point okay yeah so maybe they're trying to smooth out okay right good well I, think right. I just to, to make to make explicit what's implicit i think is the idea exactly yeah well yeah. i think i just heard somebody hit a buzzer in the far distance which means it's now time to announce our giveaway winner and <laughs> at the winner's name in the list of participants. Just so y'all know, I went to random.org and I generated a random number between the number of attendees and the fortunate Makarios winner is Christopher Schrock. Woo! Christopher, 
if you're with, oh. if you're with Christopher, would you like to say anything? Christopher? He's stunned. Did, I think, oh, I think Christopher he just left. He's muted. Is Christopher here? Or did Christopher just leave the... the, the he is here, but it looks like he's muted. There's maybe. also a Christopher Sam who showed up. There's two Christopher. No, it's, um, it's Christopher Schrock. Anyways, all right. If Christopher's not going to speak Hello? up, that's all right. We're going to keep oh, moving. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. I had to find, I had to find the button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, really quickly, tell us something fantastic. Uh, oh, boy. I live in Billings, Montana. It's a lot of fun out here. My wife and I have six kids, okay. and I'm a pastor. Ooh, wonderful. Nice. Well, congratulations. You're the winner. Um, please send me your email address and we'll get your copy sent to you. Okay. I'll be in touch with you. Let's keep rolling. Um, Somebody. Um, can I, can I, Peter, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hijack, but I have the book. So I'd love for somebody else to have it. <laughs> oh, really? You want somebody else to win it? Wow. Sure. Yeah. This. This All great. Right. Pick a number between one and 200 and um, one and 212. 14. What? Okay. Um, I guess that's as random as anything. Let's see here. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. It's Ann White. Ann, we're going to keep moving, but Ann White, if you can hear me, please um, message me your email address and, um, and um, I'll be in touch. We'll get you your copy. If you don't want it, let me know and we'll, uh, we'll give out a copy of the, the hexapleric <laughs> fragments or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's that right. It's amazing. Making Good it cool again. <laughs> so great. Okay, take it away, Peter. Oh, sorry. You you dropped out there for a second. What are we doing? Next one. Um, next example. Okay. Well, so why don't you just one. choose 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 one more? I think. Choose one more. Okay, I'm gonna do, go with my personal favorite because I just oh. did a lot of work on this one. There Mead it is. Me knows he's bracing himself. I know. <clears throat> okay, so I want to look at Ephesians 5:22 because okay. this is a place where um, the variant affects not actually doesn't really affect the translation at all. Pretty much your translation is gonna have to be the same no matter what, but it often does have effect on the paragraphing, which is something you may not think about. Uh, when it comes to translation, but variants can affect that as well, okay? So in Ephesians uh, 5.22, we have the start of what's sometimes called the Hebrew household code or the instructions to, uh, to various members of the, the ancient household, so wives, husbands, children, parents, uh, and then slaves and masters. And the, ver the start of it, or putatively the start of it, is wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. Uh, but as mm -hmm. you can see in the CSB, they've given you a footnote saying other manuscripts omit the word submit, okay? Um, and so if we look at our apparatus, sure enough, by the time we get to the, the reading of the actual text, we find that some manuscripts do not have a verb there in Greek. It's mm -hmm. hygunikos tois idios androsin hos to kurio, all right? And there's no verb, which is somewhat odd. So you have to supply the verb, you have to presume it from the verse before, where we get the participle, uh, hupatasomenoi, all right? And if you look at your UBS and your Nestle, you'll even see they've paragraphed it so that verse 21 is included with verse 22. And it, mm -hmm. and it may seem a bit weird to Greek readers to, to start a new paragraph with a participle, and indeed that is a bit weird. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason they've done that is because verse 22 has no explicit verb, at least in their text, right? Okay, and so you'll see English translations wrestling with this, where, where they'll move the heading around. Uh, the, the latest NIV now puts the heading before verse 21, starts a new paragraph with verse 21, but then starts another new paragraph with verse 22. Hmm. Whereas the previous NIV, the 1984, did it a bit differently. So you can see they're, they're, they're wrestling with what to do here with the lack of a verb yeah. in verse 21, okay? Now, in this case, the, the manuscripts that don't have a verb are P46, and unfortunately we have a typo in our UBS 5 at this point. It's not P56, it should be P46 oh, no. there. Yeah, oh, so it's, cor it's correct in your I'm Nestle on 28. Yeah, but it, that is wrong. Uh, and then Codex Vaticanus, which is a very important manuscript, that's, those are really our two earliest copies of Paul's letters, okay? 
certainly the two earliest copies we have of this portion, okay? So you can see that, that uh, editors have felt the pressure here to follow the earliest manuscripts, P46 and B. Then we have Clement of Alexandria, who's early. But uh, if we look at him closer, it actually his, his testimony is split. In one place, he, he has a verb. In another place, he doesn't. More important is Jerome, who in your, in your Nestle, Alon is abbreviated as, with his Latin H-I-E-R, Hieronymus, okay? Um, Jerome actually explicitly discusses this and says that his Greek manuscripts do not have a verb, but that his Latin ones do, okay? So mm. he makes a point in his commentary on Ephesians of talking about text, this textual variant, and he says the Greek manuscripts have no verb here, okay? So unless Jerome himself knew of P46 and B, which to me seems somewhat unlikely, Jerome must have known about manuscripts that we no longer know about that also lack the verb. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side of the ledger, most manuscripts have a verb. They either have the second person plural imperative, hupotestestai, why it's B subject, U B subject, or the third person, hupotestestosan, which is let wives be subject to their own hmm. husbands. Okay. But I'll just point out that most Christians throughout church history have had a verb here in this passage. Okay. And it's not right. surprising that when we look at manuscripts, then every manuscript I've been able to check has a new paragraph, if it has a new paragraph, has one at verse 22 and not at verse 21, okay, for that reason. Um, now, most commentators, in fact, every, every commentator I've read prefers the lack of a verb here as the harder reading, okay? And the argument is very simple and, I, and, and convincing to most people, and that is... Uh, if a scribe came across a version of Ephesians 5.22 with no verb, they would feel the awkwardness of it, just like we do, and they would supply a verb, and the verb they would supply was from the previous verse, which is clearly the, the verb Paul intends from the context, okay? That much is clear. And I think they're right about that. The issue, though, is, is trying to explain why scribes would ever fill in that awkward gap with a third-person plural imperative, mm -hmm. which is very rare, not only in Ephesians, but in the New Testament as a whole. And it's even more unusual given that all the other people that are addressed in this household code are addressed with a second person plural imperative, okay? In other words, if you're a scribe and you're gonna fill in this awkward gap, you would almost certainly do it with a second person in plural, which is the common form and the form used in the context. You would not use the, the awkward third person plural here. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, when we look at the third person plural and consider it on, on its own merits, it actually has a good claim to being original. And the reason is because if we have that third person plural imperative there, we see that the last three letters of that imperative are sigma, alpha, nu, san. And the word occurring right before it is andrasin, which is sigma, iota, nu, which looks very, very similar, mm. right? So one of the things that most commentators will say in preferring the shorter reading is they'll say, look, we can easily explain why the longer readings were created to fill in this gap, but there's no good explanation for the shorter reading. But it turns out, actually, if you look more closely at it, and if you are willing to consider that the third person imperative is the original, then actually there's a very simple explanation for the shorter reading. And it's a very simple mistake. And in fact, you can find this exact same confusion elsewhere in P46 where the same combination of uh, sigma iota nu precedes sigma alpha nu, and the scribe of P46 alone left out the word ending uh, uh, with sigma alpha nu. Does that make sense? Mm. No, this is literally this exact yeah. same letter combination caused, caused an accidental omission elsewhere in P46. Certainly in, in, in Vaticanus, we can find plenty of other places where accidental omissions right. occur as well. So, you're so really, I actually think... You're the, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think a far simpler explanation here is that the third person uh, plural imperative is the original, and that gave rise to the second person, which is the more typical form. So it's just a simple wow. harmonization to the context and to the more standard uh, expectation. And then the shorter reading is easy to explain as an accidental omission, the kind we see all right. the time. Wow. So you're really getting down to the individual letter level. That's right to really parse out which explains the others, et cetera. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, and again, then the implication of that in terms of translation is the paragraph should certainly start at verse 22, not at verse 21. Verse 21 then naturally reads with what precedes, 
where it goes with the other participles speaking to one another in psalms and hymns singing songs giving thanks always and then the last explanation of being filled with the spirit is submitting to one another in in, in the fear of the lord yeah the fear of christ wow okay i'm looking at my local language version here again one of the languages of cameroon and um, they put a paragraph at verse 21 Yep. And a paragraph at verse 22. So they've kind yeah. of sectioned out verse yep. 21 yep. by itself as a separate paragraph, which is an interesting way to kind of signal yep. kind of the, um, some of the... Anytime you see there. something really weird in the translation, ask yourself if there's some difficulty behind it, right? Hmm. And in this case, okay. there is, but I think there's a simpler solution to it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to try to wrap this up within the next seven minutes. I want to be um, respectful of everyone's time. I know people, uh, I, I find this fascinating. I could keep going forever. But John, um, why don't you take us to another um, Hebrew example? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's look at Isaiah 53, 11, uh, if you would. I think I'm skipping, yes. the, I'm skipping the Ruth example, which is a good one too. These, these were all very great. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Isaiah 53, 11, uh, I'm happy to see that most English translations have jumped on board uh, with, hmm. with the reading that I'm going to present here in a moment. But, but the, this, this text would be uh, probably best translated as, you know, because of the travail of his soul, right? We're talking about the suffering servant here. In Isaiah 53, because of the, the, the travail of his soul, he will see, he will be satisfied, okay, uh, hmm. is, a, is a very literal translation. There's no object for what he will see in the, uh, the BHS or the, the Masoretic text, okay. So, um, uh, and the NJPS uh, supplies an object. Out of his anguish, he, will, he shall see it, which is not in the text anywhere. Uh, hmm. And they interpret that it as the arm of the Lord, according to their note. And uh, they want us to see the preceding note, which I guess is given, uh, given to us here, whereas offspring uh, or the emendation yields his arm. That is his vindication. So, hmm. so the fascinating thing is that everyone kind of recognizes there's a direct object here. Uh, they have to supply something. Uh, something has to be seen. Uh, rarely, if ever, is the Hebrew verb ra'ah used without an object of some kind. And uh, thankfully, we actually don't have to look very far here because uh, the VHS apparatus gets us going with citing uh, two Dead Sea Scrolls. One known as 1Q Isaiah A, which is the great Isaiah scroll, pretty much the entire book of Isaiah, uh, with a few holes, right? But, but pretty much the entire book is there for us, dated to around 150 to 100 BC. It's fascinating. It's online. Look it up. It's great to look at. Uh, there's also a, a lesser known manuscript known as 1Q Isaiah B. Uh, one meaning the, the first cave at Qumran, okay? And uh, the, little in, the little indices of A, B, C, D, or whatever uh, are meant to, di- to, to differentiate between all of the, the scrolls found there, the fragments found mm-hmm. there. Well, in this mm-hmm. case, 1Q Isaiah A and B and the Septuagint, and I would also add another Dead Sea Scroll, uh, 4Q Isaiah D, which BHS doesn't have, but, but if you look at all the evidence for this problem, there's actually a third Dead Sea Scroll which also has the reading or, or light, uh, they all have the text, he will see light and he Mm. will be satisfied. Okay. Uh, And the metaphor is found, it's a very common metaphor in the Old Testament. Uh, Look for no further than Isaiah 9, where light will shine, right? Uh, on uh, on On the Gentiles, right? On the nations. That is these, these Gentiles who are, who are wayward, lost, uh, 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 dying, uh, they're going to come to life, you see. Um, there are more explicit references. I think it's like in Job 36, uh, Elihu uh, imagines one coming back from Sheol and seeing light, okay? Hmm. Uh, and so here, um, <clears throat> uh, the suffering servant who has died, according to chapter 53, verse eight, he's dead, 
Uh, in verse 9, he is buried. Uh, he's in a tomb. These are all textual problems as well that I'm glossing over, Drew. And then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, here, uh, there's, another, there's a third textual problem that affects translation of this passage. He will see light. Uh, so the question then is, is how are these Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, which is down in Alexandria, right, not tied to the land or, or the cave, the, the scribal work at Qumran, uh, how, does, how does the word light get there? Well, the easiest explanation in this case is that uh, these independent witnesses had access to the same common, more original text that contained the word light. Uh, I'm going to share a, a link. Uh, you can you can go to this blog post on the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog. Uh, I write this problem up in some detail. I actually give you the, the images of the Qumran manuscripts uh, that I can. You'll notice uh, from some of those images, if you can, if you can read them, there's actually a, a very simple explanation for this. And that is the final letter of the verb he will see, this, this Hebrew letter A, uh, actually, in the, in the great Isaiah scroll, looks like the combination of letters uh, for, for, for the word uh, light, uh, the, the, the first two letters, actually. And so I think what happens is the scribe copies the verb and skips the similar looking letter in the next word and, and, and goes to the next word, you see. And so, so my thought is there is that early on, Probably around, we can date this actually, to, this error must have occurred sometime around the first, second century AD, and then was simply transmitted through the rest of the Middle Ages all the way to the Leningrad Codex. All the evidence that I've cited, the three Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint of Isaiah, are all earlier than that date. So you can actually, wow. in this case, I think, date this error uh, reasonably, wow. and, and then see how it's kind of influenced the rest of the tradition. There are Christian scribes like Eusebius and others who comment on this problem, noting that Oculus, Simicus, and Theodosian don't have this reading, okay? Those guys I mentioned earlier, those Jewish revisers, they don't transmit a text that contains light. They just mm. have, he will see. He will be satisfied. Right. That's all they have in Greek. That's all they have. Uh, but the Christians who are reading those Jewish or revisers know uh, that it's not found in the Hebrew at this time, right. but they are unaware, well, they have the Septuagint, but they're unaware that the reading is found in three Hebrew Dead Sea Scrolls, you see. So, right. uh, hiding yeah. in a cave. Hiding in a cave, that's right, that's right. So uh, again, uh, modern work here, I think is helpful, uh, discovering these scrolls. Uh, and then here, I think that the scrolls uh, solve, uh, or help us solve a major problem uh, that was in the so, text here. Yes. So just thinking about this, you know, if you'll permit me just to speak a little bit yeah. roughly, here, it sounds like this is kind of a convenient reading for Christians. So the yeah. fact that there's evidence for this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so give me a timeline. Does What does it mean that this reading is also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Does that predate Christianity? Is that oh, yeah. concurrent good, good with question. Christianity? Yeah, yeah the, four, the three Dead Sea Scrolls that we're talking about are all dated to like, you know, latter half of the second century, first century BC. Okay, so this, okay. this is definitely predating Jesus. Uh, yeah, no, so it's no not question. It's possible that this could right. be a corruption of scripture to support no. Christian. So, some, some try to explain the reading in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, as some kind of a interpretive translate in the translation, interpretation in the translation um, that could be tied to like mystery religions or Gnosticism or something like this. Uh, so when the reading of the Septuagint was confirmed by these later discovered Dead Sea Scrolls, all of those theories had to disappear. There was no way you could explain like Christian corruption of the sure. Septuagint text, you see, right. by the addition of light, once you found it independently in three different Hebrew manuscripts. So hmm. I know this seems like a convenient reading, but uh, it is the, where the evidence goes. So I, right. I don't know. Okay. And yeah, good question, good, good comment. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, without exploring that further. Well, um, <laughs> just being aware of the time here, 
Um, I think we could all keep going, just exploring all these examples, but I, I wanna um, let you guys go. Um, if we could just wrap up here quickly, I, you know, I'm just thinking about implication, just kind of a takeaway for translation. There seems to be a high probability that translations we do today could contain a variety of readings and um, a choice of textual variants, the, the collection of which isn't represented by any one manuscript or any one tradition leading up to now. So help me, th is that okay? Is that not okay? Should we just stick with one tradition and reproduce that today? Or is it okay to kind of piecemeal? Uh, does that make sense, my question? So I think, I think you know, there's, there's an appropriate deference to give to tradition because it's become the tradition and it usually got to become the tradition by some means. But also remember that tradition had to come from somewhere itself. So something, take something like, uh, I'll speak out of turn here, but take something like the Leningrad Codex, right? Um, that had to come from somewhere and that had to involve scholarly effort of its own, of its own kind. And so it's not really a question of can scholarship and can, can thinking carefully about these issues be avoided because it can't be avoided. Mm -hmm. It's really a question mm -hmm. of whether you want to be involved in that process as an active agent or whether you are just going to say, I can't, I'm too afraid to even, even think about mm -hmm. it. So I'm just gonna let somebody else do it for me. Right. Mm -hmm. As I had a professor used to say, it's not a question between doing textual criticism and not doing it. It's a question of whether you'll be involved in doing it or whether you're just going to defer to somebody else who does it for you. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, and that really is, at the end of the day, that's what it is. So again, I'd go back to my larger point at the beginning, to the, to, given the time and ability and gifts, et cetera, that you have, how should you be involved in it is, is a question you have to answer for yourself, right? Um, right. But I think we could all be involved at some level, right? And we can't just ignore okay. it. That doesn't help. Well, anybody. that's really encouraging. Yeah, so again, seeing ourselves in this long line of interpreters, translators, interactors, recipients of the tradition that's been handed down to us. Yes, John, did you have something, just kind of summary remarks? No, I, I think Peter summarized it well. I, I, and again, the, the Old Testament situation is just so different in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, yeah, it's just an utter lack, well, not an utter lack, but there's just not as much energy expended to doing Old Testament textual criticism. And so, hmm. so I'm always going to be kind of erring on the side of, let's do it, let's report on it, let's talk, you know, let's get the variants out in the open. Um, it's just because it's so different than looking at your, your UBS 5 for the New Testament. I, I'm looking at one manuscript and all manuscripts contain errors. So I know my VHS is, er is error riddled right, hmm. right from the get-go. <laughs> and so anyway, so my, my thought is, don't just transmit that one manuscript. You're, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do some more digging uh, when, when it comes time to translating the text of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so let's keep digging. Well, gentlemen, I want to um, close now with just kind of a short prayer of blessing over both of you. My colleague, Harry, has accepted to pray for you just to um, encourage you in your work. Um, and I see loads of people in the chat here saying, you know, will there be follow-ups? Will there be more webinars? I'm planning more translation-related webinars. I don't know. Maybe our esteemed guests would be open to being welcomed back for a part two. I've got um, tons more questions, tons more topics we could have explored together. Um, we just didn't, you know, it's just, it's a fascinating topic. So maybe if you guys are up to it, we could have you back. We could do a part two, and then we'd be sure to notify everybody. Um, but Harry, let's um, go ahead and close this time out with a word of prayer for our brothers here. Sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the two men and all the research they've done and for the peoples and generations before who've done similar research. Yeah. We, we actually reap what they've done. We, they've done lots of work on it and we can then benefit from it. And as we are involved with translation and teaching and training, we'll take their work and spread your word throughout the whole world, which is what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you for them. Thank you for their scholarship and the students that they'll be teaching. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. You are, you're, you're free to bounce. Um, 
I might just stick around here a little bit and see the flood of thank yous coming in. You know, it's kind of nice. Yeah, seeing everybody. Um, I, I want to apologize. You know, a lot of people sent in questions that we didn't get to, but I hope this piqued everyone's interest to keep going. Feel free to write to me, um, anybody who doesn't feel like we scratched your itch, and I'll try to point you to um, resources or, or other things where you can keep going. Um, but I think that's it. All right, Peter, John, you guys are free to go. Thank you guys so some... much. Drew, thank really you all so you. much. This is great. We so. appreciate, no, appreciate you guys doing all the legwork on this. Yeah, um, no man. Definitely. Uh, that's it's really great. great to have you guys. Thank all you right. for your availability. Yeah. All right. Talk to Take you care, y'all. Right. Yeah. Take care. Bye.